Thank you, Pierre. Thank you all for uh, coming. So the, the title of this talk is, is Two Pillars of Asset Pricing. I, I really wanted to call it the Siamese Twins of Asset Pricing, but I didn't think that was uh, n uh, noble uh, enough. And you'll see why I prefer that title if I exposit this uh, in any uh, clear way uh, at, at all. And it's really two branches of, of research. One is about efficient capital markets, which pair uh, mentioned, and the other is asset pricing models uh, per se, and those are the two uh, branches that I've worked on for uh, 50 years, and that I'm going to talk to you about. I, I always say I can I can give you my life's work in in 10 minutes or a whole quarter. You're going to get the 30 minute version. <laughs> okay, so uh, we start with efficient uh, efficient capital markets. <clears throat> And I go back to when this was really starting. And 1962 was a really propitious time for PhD research at the University of Chicago. Computers were coming into their own, liberating econometricians from their mechanical calculators. It became possible to process large amounts of data quickly. Stock prices are among the most accessible data, and there was lots of interest in studying the behavior of stock returns primarily at the University of Chicago and MIT. It was clear from the beginning that the central question is whether asset prices reflect all available information, what I labeled the efficient markets hypothesis. The difficulty is making the hypothesis testable. We can't test whether the market what it does what it is supposed to do unless we specify what is it is supposed to do. In other words, we need an asset pricing model, a model that specifies the characteristics of expected asset returns in a market equilibrium. Tests of efficiency basically test whether the properties of expected return implied by the assumed model of market equilibrium are observed in actual returns. If the tests reject, we don't know whether the problem is an inefficient market or a bad model of market equilibrium. This is the joint hypothesis problem that I emphasized in my 1970 Journal of Finance paper. In the early days before that paper, the key role played by assumptions about the characteristics of market equilibrium and tests of market efficiency just went unrecognized. For example, it was common to propose that market efficiency implies that stock returns are unpredictable from past returns, which implies that the autocorrelations of returns, the correlations between current and past returns, should be indistinguishable from zero. Many early papers focused on autocorrelations. The implicit model of market equilibrium never acknowledged in the tests is that the market is trying to price stocks so that their expected returns are constant through time. Market efficiency is always tested jointly with a model of market equilibrium, <clears throat> but the converse is also true. Conver common asset pricing models, like the capital asset pricing model of Sharp and Lintner, developed in the mid-1960s, Merton's intertemporal CAPM, and the consumption CAPM of Lucas and Breeden from the late 70s, Assume that all information is costly av costlessly available to all market participants who use it correctly in their portfolio decisions. In other words, they assume a strong form of market efficiency. Thus, tests of these asset pricing models jointly test market efficiency. And that's what I meant when I said these are the Siamese twins of, of, uh, of asset pricing. The joint hypothesis problem is obvious on hindsight, but it's important in work on market efficiency was not recognized before my 1970 paper, uh, which brought it to the, the, f the forefront. That's, that's kind of the characteristic of everything I do. It's obvious on hindsight, but it wasn't obvious uh, b before the fact. <clears throat> the, the, the second part of this uh, section on capital markets is about event studies. So in, in the initial empirical work on market efficiency, the test, the, the test centered on predicting returns using past returns. In a 1969 paper that I co-authored with uh, Larry Fisher, Mike Jensen, and Richard Rowe, extend the test to, extends the test to the adjustment of stock prices to the announcements of corporate events. In the FFJR, the uh, event is stock splits. But the impact of the paper, the long-term impact of the paper, traces to the empirical approach it uses to aggregate the information about price adjustment in a large sample of events. 
Like other corporate events, the sample of splits is spread over a long time period, in this case, 1926 to 1960. To abstract from general market effects that can obscure a stock's response to a split, we use a simple market model time series regression. That's this little equation here. So in this equation, RIT is the return on a, a stock that splits its shares, not necessarily a month T, but this is just the return on a stock. This is a constant, this is a constant, this is the market return, and this is a residual. Now what this, these two terms pick up is the average return on the stock and its normal response to the market. Everything else goes into this term. So the effect, the, into the residual term. So the effect of the split on the return shows up uh, in the residual. And the tests focus on examining the properties of, of, of those residuals. Now the, the cute little insight that we had was if you, if you really want to aggregate this information across all of the stocks that experience a split, you change the way you measure time. So you, you measure time relative to the event. So Time zero, we only had monthly data at this point. Time zero is the month when the, when, the, uh, when the split occurs. Time minus one is the month before that. Time plus one is the following month, and, and, and so on. So what we did was we averaged these residuals across, I think there were 670 splits, in event time. So we get the average residuals, 30 months, we went to minus 30 to plus 30, from 30 months before the event, uh, to 30 months after the event. And we, we looked at those average residuals, and we also examined the cumulative average residuals. So we just cumulate that series of, of, uh, uh, of averages. <coughs> let, let me put up the... Uh, so this is, <laughs> this is the, 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 the striking picture that emerged from that study. This is the plot of the cumulative average residuals from 30 months before the split this is the split month here, and this is up 30 months after the split. <clears throat> and these are averaged across all of the 670 companies that uh, did stock splits in this, in this time period. So you see this, this is the path of what happens in advance of, of the split. So you see this cumulative going uh, straight up. So what, what it says, quite obviously, is that companies split their stocks after they've experienced uh, good times, um, and, and that's easily documentable in terms of dividends, earnings, and, and, and that stuff. Now, it looks like you can make money on this. <laughs> well, you, you could make money on it if somebody told you the split was going to occur. That would be really valuable information, but you don't know that until it's announced, and it's not announced until uh, very near uh, the event. But what market efficiency says is all the information that that implies should get into the price at the time when the information comes out, which is time zero, and thereafter, it should be just random. And that's exactly what you observe here. This is it's incredibly flat after the... So there's no more price adjustment, despite the fact that 75% of these companies continue to uh, have good times in the, uh, in the years after the, after the split. <laughs> a little aside here, when we, uh, we submitted this paper to a journal and the, came back with a referee's report that said, this is great, just publish it. That never happened again in my entire <laughs> history that they didn't uh, request any rewrites of, 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 of the paper. Now this paper, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bragging unashamedly here. Uh, <laughs> this paper spawned an event study industry. I mean, there, there have literally been thousands of people that have studied different, different events. Um, to look at the, how, adjust, how, how prices adjust to the announcements of, of specific kinds of events. Finance journals are filled with them. Um, this really was the paper that launched uh, serious academic research in, uh, in, in accounting. Um, it was, for a long time, the most highly cited paper in accounting. And I'm not an accountant. <laughs> <so>. <clears throat> Okay, so then we move on to a, a different topic altogether, uh, predictive uh, regressions. The, the early work on market efficiency focuses on, on stock returns. In a 1975 paper, I, I turned to bonds to study Irving Fisher's market efficiency hypothesis that the interest rate 
IT, think of T as a, uh, successive values of T's as, as a, a month. So the interest rate set at the beginning of the month for the period from T to T plus one contains an expected real return on the bond plus an assessment of the expected inflation rate. So the, 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 the market efficiency issue is, is this prediction of inflation over the period covered by the bond, is it an efficient prediction? Does it use all available uh, information? And that's what I, I uh, set out to test in this paper. And the simple insight, again, a simple insight, was that if you want to extract the information about expected inflation in the interest rate, what you do is flip this equation over. And you put the inflation rate on the left-hand side, and you put the interest rate on the right-hand side. Because what a regression does is it gives you the estimate of the expected value of the variable on the left as a function of the variable on the right. And that's exactly what you're interested in. To what extent does this interest rate contain an efficient assessment uh, of the expected inflation rate? Now again, this, was, this is an incredibly simple idea, but all the papers that had done this previous to this did the regression the other way. They regressed the interest rate on, the, on lagged uh, inflation, inflation rates, which has a, a, a huge measurement error uh, problem uh, associated with it. Now, when you do it this way, you're using more than the information in past inflation rates. You're using all the information that the market used to set that uh, interest rate. Now, there is a potential measurement error problem, what we call a measurement error problem in econometrics, because there is this term also in the interest rate, the expected real return. Uh, so in this paper, I proposed a very simple model for the expected real return. It's constant. When, if that's just a constant, it doesn't have any T's on it, what that says is the interest rate varies one to one with the expected inflation rate. So what we expect to see down here is this, this B should be indistinguishable from one. And when I tested that on one month, three month, and six month treasury bills, this number was really close to one, and these residuals were totally unpredictable from their uh, past values. So interest rates set at the beginning of the month can seem to contain rational forecasts of uh, inflation uh, over the month. Um, the simple idea that the regression of, re of a return on predetermined variables produces estimates of how the expected value of the return varies with the forecasting variables have, has served me and others uh, well. I, when I talk about this in a familiar way, I say, when I come up with an idea, I beat it to death. And, and that's, that's what I did here. I produced a, a, a sequence of papers that use this uh, simple insight in a variety of, of ways. So I initially used it in a sequence of papers to address an old literature in the term structure literature, which is how well do forward rates that can be extracted, extracted from the prices of longer term uh, bonds forecast future short term uh, interest rates. These papers introduce what I called a, a complementary regression approach, basically two regressions run uh, simultaneously that split the information in forward rates between near-term expected returns on longer-term bonds and forecast of future short-term interest rates. Now, I, I kept trying to do this in a way that I could explain in a short amount of time, but to do it properly, I have to introduce so much term, term structure note I said, it's not worth it. So, um, uh, suffice it to say that most of the information in forward rates seems to be about near-term expected returns and not about uh, short-term interest rates. In a 1984 paper, I applied the complementary regression approach to study forward foreign exchange rates as predictors of future spot rates. Again, the information in forward exchange rates uh, seems to be about risk premiums, and there is little or no information about uh, future spot rates. The exchange rate literature has puzzled over this result for 30 years. One of my young colleagues, just before I left, gave me a, 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 a manuscript in which he takes up this issue uh, one, one more time. Uh, using the complementary regression approach, uh, in a 1987 paper, Ken French and I, my longtime uh, co-author, find that future prices, futures prices for a wide range of commodities do show power, power to forecast uh, future spot prices, which seems to be the exception to the, the uh, general rule. Now, 
the next topic is uh, time varying expected uh, stock returns. Early work on market efficiency generally assumes that uh, equilibrium expected stock returns are, are constant through time. This is unlikely to be, be true. The expected return on the stock contains compensation for bearing the risk of the return. Both the, both the risk and the willingness of investors to bear the risk are likely to change through time, leading to a time varying expected return. The trick is to find predetermined variables that can be used to track expected returns in forecasting regressions. In a 1977 paper, Bill Schwert and I document variation in monthly, quarterly, and semi-annual expected stock returns using regressions of monthly, quarterly, uh, and, and semi-annual stock returns on predetermined uh, interest rates. In later work, the pop popular forecasting variable on the right-hand side of the equation is this, the dividend yield. The ratio of dividends for the year preceding month T divided by the price at the beginning of the, of the, the month. The motivation for this regression, which I attribute to a 1978 paper by uh, Ray Ball, is that a stock's price is the present value of the stream of expected future dividend, where the discount rate is approximately the expected stock return. Thus, a high stock price relative to dividends is likely to signal a lower expected return, and vice versa. The word likely is needed because the price also depends on uh, expected future dividends, which means the dividend yield is a noisy proxy for the expected stock return, a problem that uh, Bob Schiller and John Campbell uh, e emphasized uh, early on. 1984 papers by Bob and Mike Roseff are the first to use dividend yields to track expected stock returns. In a 1987 paper, Ken French and I add an interesting wrinkle. We find that the explanatory power of the regression measured by the regression R squared, the proportion of variance explained, increases as the horizon for the return is extended in steps from a, a month to four years. This result may seem surprising, but it is just a consequence of the fact that dividend yields are persistent. That is, they're highly autocorrelated. For example, with persistent dividend yields, the slope and the regression of the quarterly stock return on the beginning of quarter yield is about three times the slope and the regression of the monthly return on the beginning of month yield. This implies that the variance of the expected return estimate in the three-month regression is about nine times the variance in the one-month regression. But the variance in the, of the residual in the three-month regression, this term, the unexpected part of the return, is only about three times the variance of the residual in the one-month regression. As a result, R squared is higher in the three-month regression. Higher R squared for longer return horizons due to the persistence of the dividend yield implies that the variance of the predictable part of returns rises faster than the variance of the unpredictable part. So in this sense, longer horizon returns are more predictable. But unpredictable variation in returns also rises with the return horizon. That is, the variance of forecast errors is, is, longer in, uh, is larger in longer-term returns. So in this more important sense, longer returns are less predictable. Uh, <laughs> bubbles. <laughs> now, if, Efficient market types like me, I'm not ready for that one yet. <laughs> efficient market types like me judge that the predictable variation in expected returns on stocks and bonds is rational, the result of variation in risk or willingness to bear risk. In contrast, behaviorists argue that much of the predictability is due to irrational swings of prices away from fundamental values. In a 1989 paper, Ken French and I again address this issue. We find that the expected returns on stocks and bonds move together, and the variation in expected returns is related to business conditions. The general result is that expected returns are high when business conditions are poor and low when they are strong. The evidence that variation in expected returns is common to stocks and bonds and is related to business conditions leads us to conclude that the resulting predictability of stock and bonds returns is rational. Behaviorists can disagree. Animal spirits can rose, roam across markets in a way that is related to uh, business conditions. No available evidence resolves this issue in a way that convinces both sides. In a famous 1981 paper, uh, Robert Schiller finds that the volatility of stock prices is higher than can be explained by the uncertain evolution of expectations about future dividends. Uh, this result implies that much of the volatility of stock prices is from time-varying 
expected returns. The market efficiency issue then is whether the variation in expected returns necessary to explain Schiller's results is beyond explanation by a model for rational expected returns. It is certainly possible to develop models for rational expected returns that produce this conclusion. But then we face the joint hypothesis problem. Do the tests fail because the market is inefficient or because we have the, the wrong model for rational expected returns? Now we come to this nefarious term, bubbles. Why do I put quotes around it? You, you'll see. <laughs> there, there's one remaining result in the literature on return predictability that warrants mention. Specifically, stock returns are somewhat predictable from dividend yields and interest rates, but to my knowledge, there is no statistically reliable evidence <coughs> that expected stock returns are sometimes negative. Uh, Ken French and I studied this issue in a 1987 paper, and I, the paper I wrote with Bill Schwert also uh, examines it. This result is important. The stock market run up to 2007 and subsequent decline is often called a bubble. Indeed, the word bubble applied to market becomes common among academics and practitioners after the traumatic events of 2008. A common policy prescription is that the Fed and other regulators should lean against asset market bubbles to preempt the negative effects of bursting bubbles on economic activity. Such policy statements seem to define a bubble. Now, I have to say it this way because when people use the word bubble, they never tell you what they mean. <clears throat> So such policy statements seem to define a bubble as a strong price increase that implies a predictable strong decline. Predictable strong decline. This also seems to be the definition implicit in most of the recent claims about uh, bubbles. But the available research provides no reliable evidence that price declines are predictable. Thus, at least as the literature now stands, confident statements about bubbles and what should be done about them are based on beliefs, not statistically reliable evidence. Okay, so now we come to actually the topic that I've spent more of my time on. Uh, um, <clears throat> this is asset pricing models, developing and testing asset pricing models. Uh, the first paper that I did is, goes back in 1973 with, with Jim McBeth. The first formal model of market equilibrium is the capital asset pricing model, the CAPM, of Sharp and Lintner. In this model, market beta, the slope and the regression of an asset's return on the market return, is the only relevant measure of an asset's risk, and the cross-section of expected asset returns depends only on the cross-section of uh, asset betas. In the early literature, the common approach to test this prediction is cross-section regressions of average security or portfolio returns on estimates of their betas and other variables. The other variables are included to test whether asset betas are indeed sufficient to describe expected asset returns. In a 1972 paper, Fisher Black, Michael Jensen, and Myron Scholes criticized this approach because it produces estimates of the slope for beta, which is the premium in expected returns per unit of beta, that seem too precise, given the high volatility of market returns. They rightly suspect that the problem is cross-correlation of the residuals in the regression, uh, which leads to underestimated uh, standard, standard errors. In a 1973 paper, Jim McBeth and I provide a simple solution to the cross-correlation problem. Instead of running the regression uh, of average asset returns on betas and other variables, we do the regression period by period, where the period is usually a month. It is easy to show that the slopes in the regression are monthly portfolio returns, whose average values can be used to test the cap and predictions that the expected beta premium is positive and other variables uh, add nothing to the explanation of the cross-section of expected returns. Now, this little equation is a good uh, example of that kind of test. So what this is, is a, it's a regression. Take all the returns on stocks for month T, uh, regress them on this BI. That's an estimate of their betas, the supposedly important variable. This is the natural log of their market capitalization, which we call size, price times shares outstanding. And this is the, the ratio of their book value to their market value uh, of equity, both measured at the beginning of the return period. Now, if this B suffices to explain the cross-section of average returns, uh, the slope here, the expected value of this slope should be zero, and the expected value of this slope should be zero. Now, what we pointed out was, when you run this regression month by month, each month what it produces is 
a portfolio return. This A1 is a portfolio return. This A2 is a portfolio return. This A3 is a portfolio return. And each of them focuses on the impact or the importance of the variable that it stands uh, in front of. So the expected value of A2 should be zero. The expected value of A3 should be zero. A simple way to test that is to run this regression every month, take the time series of the A1s, the A2s, and the A3s, compute the mean, and just do a t-test. Uh, against zero. Now, <laughs> what, what happens when you do that is you're basically doing repeated, repeated sampling. Um, the repeated sampling, the way these, n these estimates vary through time, will be affected by the covariance matrix of these residuals. So that the time series jumping around of these, of these slopes will pick up the effect of cross-correlations that was missing in the estimates that just ran average returns. Uh, on the variables. So again, this is a very uh, simple kind of insight, but it's a very powerful insight because you pick up the effects of cross-correlation without, have without having to estimate the, the correlation matrix. In fact, estimating the correlation matrix is impossible if you have like 500 monthly returns and 3,000 observations on the uh, 3,000 stocks in the, in the regression. <clears throat> now, you got, they, they just gave me the card. I'm going to get gonged in five minutes here. So <laughs> when we ran, ran this regression, what we found was this average slope is, is, uh, is negative. Small stocks have higher average returns than big stocks. This one is positive, and they, they're quite statistically significant, which says that beta is not a sufficient measure of, of uh, uh, expected uh, returns. Now... The early, evidence, the, the early evidence on the CAPM was generally favorable, uh, but the, the, the golden age of the model didn't last that long. In the 1980s, violations labeled anomalies began to surface. Uh, Bonds finds that market beta does not fully, fully explain the higher average returns of small stocks. There are other papers that show that the earnings price ratio adds to the explanation of, of returns that's not captured by beta. Book to market ratios is the same thing. Now, these came out in a series of papers that looked at one of these anomalies at a time. And viewed one at a time in the papers that discovered them, the CAPM anomalies seemed like curiosity items that show that the CAPM is just a model and can't be expected to explain the entire cross-section of expected returns. And then in a, in a 1992 paper with Ken French, uh, we examined all the common anomalies together. Now, apparently, seeing everything in one place led readers to accept our conclusion that the CAPM just doesn't work. The model is an elegantly simple and intuitively appealing tour de force that lays the foundations of asset pricing theory, but its major prediction that market beta suffices to explain the cross-section of expected returns seems to be violated uh, in many ways. Now, in terms of citations, this, this paper is second in the Journal of Finance uh, all-time hit list. The impact of the paper was really surprising since there's nothing new in it aside from a clear statement of the implications of the accumulated empirical problems of the, uh, of the CAPM. So <laughs> I have, uh, I don't know, three minutes here to explain 20 years of research. Uh, <laughs> so this, this is the model that Ken French and I proposed to uh, replace the capital asset pricing model. It's the so-called three-factor model. So what we did is we added to the market beta here we added a second variable, small minus big. The difference between the return on a per diversified portfolio of small stocks and, and big stocks, and HML, the difference between the returns on diversified portfolios of high and low uh, book-to-market stocks. And then the regression equation used to test the model is this one. So no expected values down here. This is run in a time series regression, not a, not a cross-section uh, regression. Now this... <laughs> Ken, Ken and I have many papers that address the empirical robustness uh, of, of this model. Now, it's a model. It doesn't work perfectly uh, by, by far, but it works a lot better than the, than the, uh, the cap at... Whoa, one minute, okay. So I have to explain seven years of work now in one minute, so time is really getting, um, getting close. Well, th this model ha it has become kind of the bogey that everyone in asset pricing... Uh, tries to knock down when they have a new 
uh, asset, asset, asset pricing model. It became the work on market efficiency penetrated into applied work uh, very slowly. Uh, this thing got made it into applied work almost before the paper was 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 published. That uh, asset managers began to pay attention to the problems of cap of the CAPM and to try to adjust their pro products to them. And then this simple model became the way that the industry started to measure its performance. So this little A here. That's the alpha of this model, the, un the unexplained return that, in principle, an active manager would, would add to the, the predictions of the, of, the, of the model. Now, it turns out they don't do that very well, but... <laughs> um, well, it's good to stop here, actually, because the rest of it I would have talked about behavioral finance, and you really don't have to talk about that very long. So. <laughs>